for being loving, but there's one thing I do have against you. You're not a forgetting church. Cornelius, Fagerberger, Ryan, that's going to that's gonna hang on you for a long time, my friend. There's things I said eight years ago that they still remember. So, um, you know, it's going to happen, right? We, we, we kid because we love. Amen? 1 John chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. Turn in your Bibles there, if you would. Uh, thank you for not only being a loving church, for, but for being a giving church. You guys are fantastic. Um, this week, I had the privilege of blessing other ministries and other people uh, because of your faithfulness to us. Um, part of our philosophy is enough for us, more for others. So I was able to write a check and send it to the church in Slovenia to encourage them and bless them in the work. So thank you. Uh, I was able to write a check uh, to uh, a person in the, in the community here that uh, d- just couldn't pay some uh, medical bills. And we said, let us help you. And so we were able to do that. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, we were uh, able to, 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 we're ready to bless another church uh, in Phoenix that does a lot of uh, work with the homeless. And so we're getting ready to do that. And we were able to help uh, another guy who's got his own ministry working with men and recovering addicts. And uh, so all that because you have been generous and faithful. So uh, thank you guys. You're awesome. And we want to keep you on top of all that God's doing in and through you. And sometimes we don't do a great job of keeping the communication lines open, but I at least wanted to give you a report regarding that. So thanks, you guys are awesome. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for giving us this time to not only rejoice in the love that you have for us through Christ, through music, but now we get to encourage our hearts and our souls in your word. Be our teacher and guide and lead us, please, Father. We need you desperately. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, some disappointments this week. Uh, I'm not one to share disappointments. I'm the eternal optimist. Uh, But some disappointments this week. Uh, The eclipse. Who was disappointed in the eclipse? I mean, I was mentioning this to you weeks ago, how I'd gone out and bought my my goggles, you know, my my 10 pairs of goggles for five bucks off Amazon, only to find out that they were counterfeit. Because if I didn't find that out, I'd be here this morning being like, all right, so turn in your Bibles to... um, and then my wife goes, honey, don't you have a pair of welding goggles? And you're thinking to yourself, what would a pastor be doing with a pair of welding goggles? Well, I did a steampunk wedding about three years ago, so I had my hat and my, my long cloak and my goggles. And I said, yes! So I went and got the goggles. I was super excited because these are far better than the, the Chinese paper goggles that Amazon had sent me. And only to find out that the shade was too low, it wasn't dark enough. So it was just one disappointment after another when all of a sudden I just gave up and I said, I don't care. So I was hanging out at Sozo. I told the staff, go out to the parking lot, have all the fun. They came in, showed me pictures. But I think the consensus for those of us here in Phoenix, it was just a little disappointing. You know, it it got a little overcast. But unless you were in the line of totality, how's that for doing my research on, on this whole event? Unless you were in the line of totality, it was just kind of a big letdown. Who would agree with that? Yeah. See, unless you were in the right place at the right time, it's all a matter of perspective, right? It was a letdown. Then I hear news. Uh, well, let me confess too. another disappointment this week. I got a speeding ticket. <laughs> Does God still love me? I don't know. I've been questioning my faith ever since then. I couldn't cry my way out of this ticket. Like I did in high school. That's another story for another time. But, uh, boy, I, I, I was priding myself in not getting a speeding ticket in, in a long time. It's been, so long the to- it's been so long that the cop said, I can now do driver's school online. I'm like, awesome. So Ryan gave me a recommendation because he's an expert in this. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I was disappointed, right? Like, uh, And then I hear, think about how Atlanta feels right now. The Atlanta Falcons just opened up their new stadium. And guess what's in the stadium in the food court? Chick-fil-A. Bad news is they're closed on Sundays. Who thought this was a good idea? Is that crazy? Right? Like, when do most football games take place? And we're going to put Chick-fil-A in the the Falcons stadium. You think a lot of people are disappointed with that? Every game they're going to walk by and be like, sweet chicken, can't have it can't have it. I'm going to tell you right now, life is full of disappointments, you guys. And um, 
I certainly don't want to add to the the list of disappointments. I, I want to encourage you. I want you to be hopeful. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to to know that the the journey that we call life is worth it. And my life verse, in case you guys didn't know this, I don't share this a lot, but Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. When God first saved me and called me to ministry, it was probably early college that uh, I came across this verse, and I said, that's my verse. This is my verse. Colossians 1, 28, and here's what it says. And we will proclaim him... And teach every man and every woman to become complete in Christ. Until that day, he calls us forward. Paul goes on to say, and for this I eagerly strive to do. Proclaim him, teach you, so that we can all mature in Christ. That's, that's my life verse. Not only as a follower of Christ, but as a pastor. Let's keep the message simple, Jesus. Let's make sure we know how maturity takes place. It's through the teaching of the word. And and the goal is maturity. The goal is to grow up. And we come to a passage in 1 John today where he shares the same sentiment. He wants us to understand what spiritual maturity looks like. He wants us to, to know that While life is full of disappointments, there's one who will never disappoint God who's ever faithful to the goal of maturing you in Christ until the day you meet him face to face. Now, in this process of growing, there are going to be obstacles. There's going to be barriers. How do we know when those barriers present themselves? How do we know to to get over them? What What are the tools that God has given us? So this morning... We're going to tackle those two areas, the journey, what does maturity look like? And secondly, how do we avoid the obstacles that are going to come into every one of our paths? So 1 John chapter 2 is where we're going to find all this wonderful, glorious, amazing truth. We're going to look at verses 12 to 17. So John writes to the early church. He himself is an octogenarian. And he's writing to this church that he deeply loves. He, he frequently addresses the church as, as little children. Just a tender father, pastor heart for the church. But here he incorporates other language which tells us that he's actually speaking to different groups in the church as far as different levels of maturity. Look at verse 12 of chapter 2, 1 John. I'm writing to you, little children... Because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you children because you know the father. And I've written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I've written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Some of the language there is familiar, isn't it? Especially that second part where he talks about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We're going to get to that here in a bit because those are some of the obstacles we face. But first, let's talk about the stages in the journey. And John isolates three groups of people here in this section, verses 12 through 14. And he wants us to understand that There are different levels in the spiritual journey. We are all at different places in our spiritual lives. Can we all just agree with that? Some of us are further along than others, and that's okay. This is the beauty of the body of Christ. And so he starts out and he addresses the little children, i.e. those at the beginning 
stage. Every single one of us came into the world as a baby. And I'm going to tell you something about babies that most of you already know. But those beginning years are years where you really have to go above and beyond in your love and your appreciation for this little child who is now, um, and sometimes you think, has interrupted your life. I mean, think about babies. They're rude. Are they not? I mean, they wake you up at all times of night. They don't care how much sleep you've gotten. They wake you up at all different times of night. They're, uh, they're lazy. They just lie around the house and just wait to be waited on. How about uncooperative? I mean, demanding things. I was like, can't this wait till the morning? No, I want it now. And there's qualities about kids that we accept. Why? Because they're babies. There are people in the church who are new to the faith. There are people in the church where the older people in the church, meaning the older, spiritually older people, should not be offended or put off by the babies in the church. Right? Because babies will act like babies. Yes, they can be rude. They can be egotistical. They can be emotionally unstable. They can be dependent on other people. But that are, that's the quality of a child. Even 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, There are many that are among you like newborn infants who long for the pure spiritual milk that by it they may grow up into salvation. See, there are points in our spiritual lives where all of us had a beginning point if we know Jesus Christ. So what we have to understand is that in the church, there are spiritual babies. And I'm going to tell you one thing that God wants for those spiritual babies is he wants them to grow up. Just like I don't want to be changing my child's diaper at age 10. Amen? Wouldn't that be a weird thing? Like in the mall, there's a person changing like a teenager's diaper. Like this is odd. Like at some point, the kid needs to learn how to get potty trained. Or even the discussion about breastfeeding in our car the other day. Our kids are like, kids breastfeed into age three and four. And we're like, yeah, it's a little odd, isn't it? I know, fun discussions in the Morgan family vehicle, right? But we all understand that there are seasons for a baby to be a baby. But the goal is to grow them up and help them mature. Here's the problem, though, with the church. The church has done a, a, a very poor job of helping people grow spiritually. And what, you happen, what happens is that people begin to be less childlike, which is true of babies is an, and is a wonderful trait, and they grow from childlikeness into childishness. And that's why the writer of Hebrews chapter 5 says, there are some among you who should be teachers of the word by now, but you're still drinking from a bottle. See, perhaps the greatest piece of unhealth in the church are people that don't ever mature beyond being childlike. They grow into childless, childishness. And I'm going to tell you right now, I cannot stand dealing with childish believers. We are all called to grow. We are all called to take responsibility of our spiritual lives. I can help in this, but it is not my job to help you grow. You have to take responsibility too. And I wonder if we as a culture have done a really poor job at this. That there are people in our churches, and I'll tell you what, I've met people in churches where they're like, yeah, I am, you know, I, I've known the Lord 50 years. And I would, I would be hard-pressed to say they even knew Jesus five minutes. There are the beginning years, but we have to grow beyond those beginning years. But what's true in those beginning years? There's two things I want to point out that John points out. Number one, that... They know that their sins are forgiven. The forgiveness of sins. This is the one thing that, boy, carries us through life to know that our sins are forgiven. Amen? To know that God could hold our sins against us, but in Jesus says, you are now going to be set free from the penalty of your sins because of what Jesus did. Not only is that a great starting point, 
but it's a great goal to realize that as we truck through life, God's going to continue to take the weight of the guilt of those sins uh, and remove them from our lives to remind us who we are in Jesus Christ. What's true of babies is true of, of the mature adults in our congregation, right? We are all forgiven of sins in Jesus Christ. Is that not awesome? But as you're learning about how forgiven you are, there's a second truth that comes in that John mentions, that you grow in understanding the fatherhood of God. That you have a God who loves you, who's going to protect you, who's going to provide for you, who's going to nurture you. See, as, as, as my children were, you know, little and they spit up on me, I didn't take it personally. You know, as my kids woke me up in the middle of the night and, you know, oftentimes I pretended like I was sleeping because I wanted, didn't want to deal with the crying baby and my wife had to wake up because I was so selfish. Confession time. Amen. What parent? Th- Come on, dads. You're in good company, right? Who of you did not pretend to be deeply sleeping so the wife could get up and deal with the kid, right? But you know what? Here's the, here's the point in all this. Even though there are all those moments in, in raising kids, there's one thing my kids knew about me and Lori. We love them. And as they grow to understand how we're going to provide for them and protect them and nurture them, there's this, there's this fondness, there's this affection, there's this intimacy that's developed where wh- while we're helping them mature, as they grow to understand our role, my, my role as a father, that I want what's good for them, that I want what's best for them. And there's a father in heaven who says, I want the same for you. So as you walk in the forgiveness of your sins and you understand the fatherhood of God in your life, you're going to continue to grow and you're going to grow out of those beginning years into the second point, which is the mature years. Now, this is the goal because we're going to deal with the middle here in a bit. So John jumps from the beginning to the goal and then he's going to deal with the the space in between. But the mature years, he says, fathers, fathers and there's there's one thing the fathers know that he repeats twice is that they know god now maturity biblically speaking refers to a deep knowledge of walking day to day with god i ran into a a guy this week at sozo coffee who um i knew his grandfather and this guy, I remember from 35 years ago of being this guy that when you were in his presence, you knew this guy walked with God. And as a young believer in Christ and someone very impressionable, I had told this, this young man about his grandfather's influence on in my life. And I said, for a young believer, I looked at your grandfather and I said, I want to have that deep, abiding, intimate relationship with Jesus that I saw in your grandfather's life. See, the goal is maturity. The goal is for every single one of us, and this has nothing to do with chronological age. I've known a lot of 70-year-old believers that are very immature. The goal is to become so mature in Christ where people who are young in the faith, they see you and they're attracted. They're like, I want to know what you know. And really all that that mature person knows is that they are daily dependent and walking closely with Jesus. Because there's two things that come out of that. There's a depth to the knowledge of God and there's a, there's a, uh, there's a stability. See, our goal is to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God. And it's just not knowledge here, it's knowledge here. See, knowledge puffs up, the Bible says, but it's the knowledge that translates into a love for, the, for God and for others that really edifies. And so we need to understand that there is a goal to grow up into Christ, into maturity that can only happen as you walk in deep, intimate knowledge with the Savior. Amen? It's just like watching the, the Trump thing on Tuesday. And I don't, it doesn't matter where you stand on this issue, but I thought it was funny and yet sad as I'm watching the, the Trump speech and I'm watching all the news stations try to clamor for a story when there was really no story, especially of the protest, right? It was like, here's the news guy like, oh, I think, I think something just went off. And they go over and it's like a little kid with a sparkler on the sidewalk going, 
you know, and then after the speech from Trump, which I thought was pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty shallow, but that's just my own personal opinion. I didn't think he accomplished much, but that's neither here nor there, all right? But after the protests, you know, they come out, and, and who do you have on the street? You have a small gang of young people. You don't see anyone older in that crowd. You just see a bunch of young people out there, and you're sitting there going, here we go. Watch the youth make fools of themselves, right? And you know the guy that got the thing kicked, right? And you know, you know that whole story, right? And I go, serves them right. Because that's what immaturity will get you. A kick of tear gas into the groin area, right? But you don't see anyone mature out there. Why? Because people go, you know, there's some battles that are not worth fighting. Amen? So I don't care where you stand politically. I just thought... What I was proud of Phoenix. I was proud of the police. I was proud of the of the government officials. We represented well, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm proud to be a Phoenician. And I just love how the news stations were trying to get a story and they couldn't. And even the next day in the Arizona Repulsive, I mean Republic, where they had the line of cops and they had the one guy on the street like going, That's so staged. And there's a part of me that go, Well, maybe there's something about fake news, but I won't go there and go do that. But so, all that to say, there's something about maturity that just, it, just, it tells you, there, you know when to fight certain battles, you know when not to fight certain battles. You know, Jeremiah 9 is a great place to, to camp out this week, where it just talks about, you know what, you've given up on trying to run with the horses, you've given up trying to be the strong guy, you know, stand 10 rounds with Floyd, you know, it, it really doesn't matter in the end. What matters is your knowledge of God that's going to provide you incredible depth and stability in your life. And that's what God wants for every single one of us here. To grow in spirituality that ultimately leads to maturity. So that five years from now, you're helping younger people grow in their faith. Ten years from now, you're helping other people grow in their faith. That's the job that God has going on in your life. Third point. And the one he expands the most. So you have the beginning stages, you've got the mature stages or the mature years. And then the third one is the formative years, which I'm going to tell you is, is the place where God has all of us if we're in Christ. And, I'm, and the formative years really have to do with warfare and, and weaponry. Notice the language that John uses in this passage. He says, young men, I'm writing to you because you've overcome the evil one. And then down in verse 14, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the, the evil one. See, these, this is a language of a battle. And one thing you need to understand is that the spiritual life is not a playground. It is a battlefield. And we have to realize that God has given us one weapon for the battle. And he refers to it here, and that one weapon is the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you the definitive weapon, the definitive tool that God uses you to form you into the image of Jesus is the Word of God. This is why I, as a follower of Jesus and a pastor, put a premium on the Word of God. This is why we, as a church, will dive into the Word of God. Because you don't want to hear my commentary on political things. My opinions really ultimately don't matter. But what matters most is God's opinion about life and our life. And so we're going to put a premium on the Word of God. And the Word of God reminds us of an important truth, and that's our position in Christ. Which are two of the, the, the key things we need to remember, which are the two blanks. Number one, you have strength in the Word of God, and you have victory in the work of Christ. Now, why is this important? Because in the war, the devil, the evil one that John refers to, is trying to sabotage you, and he's going to try to do it in two ways, through accusation and through temptation. So what the devil does is he's, gr he's going to try to accuse you because this is what he does best. And if you remember a few messages ago, at the beginning of chapter 2 of 1 John, he talks about Jesus being our advocate. And Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father, pleading our case to the Father. And we have this advocate who's for us, not against us. 
we have this defense attorney who is constantly working to make intercession for us day and night. And so while the enemy tries to accuse us and sabotage us, we need to be reminded of who we are in Christ because we have victory through the work of Jesus. Amen? And there's nothing the enemy could ever accuse you of that's going to change your position in the family of God. That keeps us going in the battle. Because there's times in the battle you feel like, boy, is God even there? Does God even care about me? Does he even love me? And you start to question your identity. And John wants you in these formative years to go back to what Jesus has done for you. Because you, if you're in Christ, you're more than a conqueror. Because you in Christ have victory and there's nothing the enemy will ever try to do to you that's going to change that position in God's family. See, we need to be reminded of this. So as we go through life, we're going to continue to press into our identity. That I'm the one Jesus loves. That I'm the one Jesus has forgiven. That I'm the one Jesus has set free. That I'm the one Jesus says, I'm going to begin a good work you and I'm going to perfect that good work, Scott Morgan. That in Jesus, Romans 8 is going gonna, is gonna to be reminded to me as, I, as I'm formed in Jesus that neither life nor death nor hell nor principalities, nothing will ever separate me from the love of God in Jesus Christ. See, as we're formed, we're pressed into our identity, not what I feel like, but what I know objectively and what Christ has accomplished for me. So John says, young people, those of you in your youth, those of you being formed, Remember who you are. You're the one Jesus loves. And nothing can change that status in God's family. But while the devil can't get you through accusation, perhaps, he's going to get you through temptation. He's going to try to get you through temptation. Which is why the strength that is derived from the word of God is critical. Can I remind you of Psalm chapter 1, verse 2? That you want to know how you remain strong and steadfast in doing what God wants you to do? Well, let that person delight in the law of the Lord. And on God's law, let that person meditate day and night. And you know what's going to happen? The, the floods w- will come. The storms will rage. But that person will stand so stalwart and stable that nothing will be able to. To, to change that person's life. Why? Because that person's heart's anchored in the Word of God. This is why the Word is important. This is why we have Bibles that are falling apart. I, th- I think I'm on my third binding for my Bible. Why? Because a Bible that's falling apart is evidence of a life that's not. Don't forget that. And I quoted that from some other pastors, so don't quote that as original, all right? But I'm going to tell you one thing. I love pouring over the word. I love getting excited about what's in here because I understand this is more than just a great literary uh, piece of work. This is God's very word given to us to help us grow, to help us mature. This is the word of life. This is the word of hope. This is the word of, of godliness that sets us on the path. Your word's a lamp to my feet. Amen? Peter even said to Jesus, you know, Jesus says, are you all going to flee from my presence and not follow me anymore? And Peter's like, where else are we to go to hear the words of eternal life? So my encouragement, my exhortation, my commendation to you, church, is to not separate yourself from this. This is critical to your maturing and your development. And so we continue to pour over the word and not just for knowledge sake but there's an obedience piece that comes to it too that when god exposes something that i should do i do it when he tells me to go a certain direction i go that way when he tells me to avoid something i avoid it because god knows what's best temptation happens in the life of a person that divorces themselves from this temptation happens When you are carried away by your affections and your attention to other things and you've gotten your eyes off the prize. And I'm going to tell you, because John goes into it, there's ways to deal with temptation. That in Christ there's always a way out. With Christ there's always power to do what's right. And so 
as we understand these formative years, we need to give ourselves to the conditions that encourage growth. And this is important. The gathering of the saints, the people of God is important. Matter of fact, turn in your, uh, in your programs. You probably have a, a little sheet like this. Pull this out real quick because I, wa- I want you to understand a, a larger framework that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm speaking of when it comes to spiritual maturity. And this is specifically with us here at Missio Day. This is important, but in the, big of this, in, the, in the big scheme of things, this is only a small part of what is ultimately important. Because as you see at the top, this is our worship gathering. This is the Sunday morning large group gathering. And you'll notice the, 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 the objective for what we do on Sunday mornings is inspiration, right? I, part of me kind of wants to put on my business card, inspirational speaker, right? Like... There's Scott. He's the one that gives us inspiration, right? Like, we get inspiration from the band as they lead us in great music. We get inspiration from the Word as we unpack the Word. But you don't just need inspiration. You need to grow from inspiration into the second group, which are what we call our growth groups. We just got done with the season of growth groups. They're very topic-focused. You'll see the objective of these, of these little larger groups are, is instruction, I met with a group called Christianity 101. Uh, There were other groups that met on different topics. But the goal is to get out of this context into maybe a little bit of a smaller group, but not so small where you're creeping out because someone says, hey, how can I pray for you? And you're like, whoa, like, that's too deep. That's too intimate for me. So we understand that there's a stepping stone that's needed to go from this gathering to something a little bit more quaint, something a little bit more intimate, but it's topic-driven. But that's not the end goal at all either. So now what we have is the next stage is a life group. Well, guess what's coming up in a couple weeks, you guys? Life groups. And what's the goal? Involvement. And what do I mean by involvement? What I mean is we go beyond just showing up on a Sunday, giving one another our pleasantries. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Have a good week. All right. See you next Sunday. We need to be more involved in that. And so what the life groups provide is an environment and a context where we can be involved in one another's lives. And on the back of your insert that Ryan pointed to earlier, we've got at least five life groups starting. And I'm going to tell you, if you're sitting there going, what's next for my spiritual life? There's your answer. God is not going to just grow you through this time on Sunday mornings. God says to each and every one of us, we must know how to practice the one another's of the scripture. Do you know how many one another's there are in the New Testament? There's 60 plus. Pray for one another, love one another, kiss one another. That's one of my favorites. Uh, t- you know, uh, carry one another's burdens. You know, one another, one another, one another. The only way you can live out the one another's is by living in involved community. Because... In this context, we don't really get a chance to connect. In this context, we really don't, need to, don't get a chance to hear what's, what's going on inside of your heart. What's, what's a pain right now in your life? How can I come alongside and encourage you? How can not only we meet spiritual needs or emotional needs, how can we meet physical needs? There could be someone right here who hasn't paid their electric bill in three months, but no one knows about it. Why? Because we're not involved in each other's lives. But all of a sudden, we're in a small group and someone hears the need. Well, guess what happens? We as the body step up and say, how can we take care of that for you? That's family. That's community. And so God says, you need to have an intentional process by which you're growing people in Christ because church attendance is not it. Which goes against the total grain of our culture. Because people equate Christianity with going to church on Sunday. People equate their faith with, well, I'm, I'm a member of this church. Well, so are the 500 other people who have died 50 years ago. It's not church membership. It's not church attendance. It's church participation. And it has nothing to do with brick and mortar. It has nothing to do with the institution. It has to do with the organism. Amen? And if you really, really want to love Jesus, look at the bottom category. One on one. What? That is just unacceptable, Pastor Scott. I can't meet with somebody one on one. Like, they're going to get to know me, like, really intensely. Yeah, like, that's a problem. 
Like, I get to know someone else that way too? Yep. Because what's the goal there is introspection. This idea that we meet with somebody else and we talk about the hard stuff. You ever thought about, like, you ever thought about who I meet with for this kind of discipleship, this kind of spiritual maturity? It's no one in the church here. I meet with a, a gentleman who is his late 70s. I call him the old sheepdog, Wayne. And we meet every few weeks, and we sit down, and this man always asks me, you know, how's your family? How's ministry? He always asks me, what are you struggling with right now? What, what has you really wrestling right now? What's got you really excited right now? And you know what? We talk openly, and here's what I know for, about Wayne, is that he wants what's best for me. And oftentimes he speaks into my life. Well, I'm going to tell you every time he speaks into my life, because here's a guy who's been around the block a few more times than I have. He's a fellow pastor, and he's a guy who understands what I'm involved in. But I avail myself to him, and he opens up his life to me. And I'll tell you what, those are deep, rich experiences. And I wouldn't trade them for the world. So my question to you is this. Who's asking you those kind of questions? What's got you really discouraged this week? What's you got you really excited this week? How can I pray for you? See, this is what we need. This is, this is the goal. This is not the goal. This is the start. But think about how God has impressed upon us this pathway. See, he wants to get you out of this context into something deeper, something more intimate. So, baby steps, right? Quote about, what about Bob? One of the best comedies ever. Baby <laughs> steps. There comes a point when I really start feeling my age, and people are like, what is what, is what about Bob? I'm like, really? Your next step, if you want to start growing, is to get into a life group. Just get into one. Come to our house on Tuesday nights. Go to Mike Bachmeyer's on Monday nights. Hang out with the Fagerbergs on Thursday night. Hang out with Ron Leofell and John Fergerberger on Thursday night. Uh, come out 6 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. Hang out with Carrie Hogan, right? Uh, we're talking about getting a women's small group together. So there is no excuse. And you don't come to me and be like, I just don't have the time. You make time for what's important to you. Okay? You make time for what's important to you. Because guarantee, you know, your favorite band comes to town and you've got a ticket to go, you're going you're gonna to make sure that happens. Amen? Someone calls you up and says, hey, I, I want to take you out to a $500 dinner. You're like, I'll, I'll move mountains, make that happen. Jesus says, I want to meet with you in a, in a more intimate context, and you find every excuse in the book to avoid it. And you're wondering why you're at where you're at. Let's follow this, okay? Let's follow this. Amen? All right. Where are we at? Oh, there we are. Okay. What are the barriers? Let's just finish this out, because we dealt with the topic of temptation and and, and something we all deal with. No one is above, no one is beyond temptation. It's one of the ways the enemy is going to try to sabotage our faith. We press close to the, the word of God and hide his word in our hearts so that we may not sin against him. Uh, but there are three things we need to be aware of. That temptation always brings before us. And they're found in verses 15 through 17. And we're going to talk about that there are things that the world cannot give that you need. There are things that the world cannot give what it promises. And there are things that the world cannot give because they will not last. First and foremost, this is an interesting section of Scripture because it tells us, and it's the only place in the Bible, where God says to not love something. Nowhere else in the Bible does it say, don't love this. Only here. And what does God tell us not to love? The world. Now, obviously, we're not talking about, like, creational world, right? God calls us to, wow, admire and appreciate creation. So that can't be what God's talking about. He's not 
told us to not love each other, right? Because we as people are part of the world, but God wants us to love people. So obviously that can't be what God's talking about. So what is God speaking of? What he's talking about is a world system, a philosophy that has really positioned itself against God. It's, it's like if I said, you know, the world of sports. Well, what world of sports am I talking about? I could be talking about uh, baseball. I could be talking about football. I could be talking about commentators. I could be talking about sports channels, right? The world of sports is everything that's involved in, or the, the world of, you know, computers or technology. I mean, there's a certain world that John says we are not to love, and that is the world that is influencing us in ways that are hostile to God. The Bible is clear that, that the enemy is, is running rampant around the world. He is, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that there's this, there's this prince and power of the air that's in control of the world and is trying to negatively influence us as followers of Christ. And what is this prince of the power of the air and this, this lion that's roaming that Peter talks about? He's trying to sabotage your faith through three things. Look at verse 15. It says this. Do not love the world nor the things in it, because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here's what John's saying. He's saying that the world cannot give you what you need. And what is it that you need? Well, every person desires to love and be loved. But there's nothing in this world that is set up to give you the love that only God can give you. So let's start with that. Any meaningful journey that's going to mean anything for time and eternity has got to start with God. And that God has positioned himself to have a relationship with us. Yes, he knows everything about you. Yes, he still loves you in spite of that, right? And he still wants to have this father-child relationship. And so the world promises to give you what a father desires to give you, but only God the Father can give you this. Because ultimately, it's like what James 4, 4 says. It says, friendship with the world is hostile, hostile towards God. There's this old church father, and when I mean old, probably about 1,900 years ago. Would you say that's old? Yeah. His name's Cyprian. He said this, that you cannot have God for your father if you have not the church for your mother. But then, it goes on, if you cannot have God as your spouse, if you cannot have God as your spouse and still have the world as your mistress. Imagine if I proposed to my wife and said, honey, I love you, I want to spend the rest of my life with you, but as a part of our relationship, do you mind if I keep other couple women on the side just for grins and giggles? You think my wife would be open to that? I don't know any sane person that would be open to that. And yet this is how we go to God, right? Like, God, I love you. You're mine. You're the only one. And yet we still keep these mistresses on the side. And God says, I want your heart. I want your undivided loyalty. I want your undivided affection. And so only God can give us what we need, though the world promises like crazy. How about the second point, that the world cannot give what it promises? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, it's from the world. Think about those three categories. Because they deal with three things that all of us dabble in. Our affections, our appetites, and our ambitions. Think about the lust of the flesh. This is temptation from within. See, what John is aiming for is he says, where does all temptation come from? Right here in my heart. The fact that this is the wellspring of my life, that this is the the central piece of who I am as a person, if I cannot control my heart and what it wants to have affection for, I am going to destroy myself. That when Eve in the garden saw that the fruit was good, you know the rest of the story. That we have to control this why we heed the words of 
Paul, when he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, Romans 13, that I have to guard my heart. There's wisdom in guarding your heart, that I control what I'm affectionate for because the lust of, of, that comes from the desires is competing with God. And I'm going to tell you right now that God does not want competition for your heart. Which leads us to our second point, which is what? The, the, the fact that we all have appetites. And, and, and what is the vehicle, the very means in which those appetites come? It's through our eyes. You ever thought about this? I'll go to, I'll go to the store with my kids. And you know, sometimes my kids are richer than me. I'm wondering where they're getting the money. I think they did a little side business. But we'll be at like Walmart, right? And my kids want to go to the toy section. And they always like beeline it to toys. And I go like, this is going to fall apart in like an hour. This is going to break tomorrow, right? And, and plus the cost. It's like, you're going to pay that much for this? And so, gonna, and so I'm trying to talk my kids out of it. And I know the only thing I can do to save them and, uh, from a lot of headache and heartache is to not let them focus too long on something. They're like, oh, what's this? And I'll be like, oh, let me take that from here. Let me d- direct your attention over here. So it's this constant like choreography going on in the store. Like, what do I help my kids avoid? Because why, you know, because the world says, feast your eyes on this. Oh, got to have that car. Like my kids are at that stage like, dad, look at that car. Why you don't like my 12 year old vehicle? The world says, look at that flashy car. Look how shiny it is. Look at that job. Don't you want that job? Look at the, look at the, 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 the pay. Look at the benefits. And all of a sudden, we are all prey to this, this lust of the eyes. See, we have a battle from within, but we also have a battle from without. And when the battle from without connects with the battle from within, disaster. So John says, be careful. David saw Bathsheba, and you know what happened. Job has said he's made a covenant with his eyes that he should not look upon a young woman with lustful thoughts. Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. And then you know what Jesus says? If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Boy, if we really follow it, it's not literal, because we all become the church like, God's is on our eyes, like, yep, I have the lust of the eyes again, right? Like, people are like, that's a weird church, right? But what Jesus is speaking to is the severity of the things you look at. And I'm not talking about the casual glance. I'm talking about the stare and the leer. The things that we sit there and go, I can justify this. I I can make a lot of excuses to have this, and we know it's exactly what God does not want us to have. Can, Can I just really encourage you guys? Guard your hearts. Guard your eyes, whether it be a girl, whether it be a job, whether it be a car, it doesn't matter. The enemy knows how to bait his hook, and he knows what you like. Don't play games. The last thing in these these points, guard your ambitions. Guard your affections, guard your appetites, guard your ambitions. The pride of life. This whole idea of keeping up with the Joneses. Got to stay on track with my neighbors. Oh, they just bought a new car. Guess what, honey? We got to buy a new car. You know, oh, the kids wear these things. I'm glad I didn't grow up in a family that had a lot of affluence, you know, a lot of money, right? Like all my friends were wearing the Izod shirts. My mom got me the one with the, the, the snail on it. Like it was like the cheap knockoff. And I'm like, really? I got to wear this? She's like, you'll be happy. You even have clothes, right? I'm like, all right, I get it, right? Like this idea of just got to keep up with what's going on and You know, the problem with our culture is that we're spending money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress friends we don't even like. I mean, can we just be honest with ourselves? Like, we are are ambitious towards all the wrong things. I'm going to tell you right now that ambition is not wrong because here's what the Bible says you should be ambitious for. The glory of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We make it our ambition, Paul says, to please Him. If that's your ambition, praise God, you're in the right place. But if your ambition is just to keep up with everyone around you, 
Well, then you're just like Eve back in the garden. She saw that the food was good for the eyes. She wanted wisdom that only God had. And so she succumbed to the temptation within and without and plunged the rest of humanity into, into to sin. Thanks a lot. The devil tried to get Jesus on this in the wilderness. Turn the stone into bread. Go up to the pinnacle, drop, jump off. Let the angels save you. Look at all the kingdoms that can all be yours. These are all the things that John isolates. And yet Jesus overcame them. Why? The power of the word of God. He quoted the word in every situation. And the last thing, verse 17 and the reason we don't live for this world is because the things of this world will not last. They're passing away. Would you invest your hard-earned money in a company you knew was going to be bankrupt tomorrow? Not, no way. Can I tell you something about me growing up? I was the Monopoly champion of Bla Blanche Drive. Did you guys know this about me? Self-proclaimed Monopoly champion took down all the neighborhood kids in Monopoly. I was proud of my accomplishments until my cousin from Texas came out, thought he was the Monopoly champion. War was on. And if you think Boardwalk and Park Place is how you win Monopoly, no. It is Marvin Gardens and Carolina Avenue. That corner, that is the secret. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something about being a Monopoly champion of Blanche Drive. I'm being serious on this, all right, guys? <laughs> As a kid, I thought I was all that because I was the Monopoly champion of Blanche Drive. But as I got older, you know what? I tried to take Monopoly money to the, to the store. Do you think they're going to take that? Do you think they're going to care about how many wins I have? How many times I avoided going to jail? How many times I passed go, collected hordes of money? See, Life is like a game, in a sense, but you should not invest in the things of this world because they're not going to last. You guys are playing a game, but it's a game that will not matter in time or eternity. You can become the champion of this, 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 or this, but if you have not championed yourself in the things of God, you will end up a loser. See, this comes with maturity, this comes with age, Church, stop living for the world. Stop living for the world. Stop li living for the accolades and the accomplishments. Let him who's going to boast, boast in this, that he knows and loves Jesus Christ. Done. So now we're not the monopoly champion of Blanche Drive. Now we're the one who Jesus loves and we will champion in the faith that he has given us because of his love for us. That is worth growing in. Amen? That is worth living for. So perhaps this is a reorienting of your perspective of life. If you want help, jump into a small group. If you want to continue to grow in maturity in Jesus of what's ultimately important, grab somebody. Get to know somebody, whether it be a Fager burger or a Ferger burger or a, or, a, or a Cornelius. Somebody, just grab somebody and say, I want to go deeper. Because I've been a part of churches where, it's true, the most segregated time in America is on Sunday mornings. And it's time we start interacting with one another, older with younger, younger with older, and we see a transference of faith happen where we can all grow into Christ-likeness. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. I know this does not disappoint. Life is full of disappointments, but walking with Jesus will never disappoint. Amen? Father, remind us of this, please. Lord, forgive us for how our affections have been for other things, how we've cast our eyes upon things that do not bring you glory or honor. Lord, we know that you give us strength and you give us wisdom to set us on a course that is directed towards glorifying you and growing in Christ's likeness. Help us do this. We know that you will give us the power to do what you want us to do. Forgive us for trying to do it on our own. Help us keep all things in perspective. Help us to live for your glory. Help us to grow in our faith. 
And may we do this as a family, as a community together. Thank you for your faithfulness toward us, for how kind you are to us, and how you care for our development spiritually. You are awesome. And we glory only in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And we pray this in His name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift His face towards you and give you His grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday, all right? See you soon.